Transmitter device activated. Coordinate set for Earth 2. Hey everyone, welcome to the Earth 2 podcast, the podcast where we explore the origins and the development of the DC Comics multiverse and the legacy of their Golden Age characters throughout the Silver and the Bronze Ages of comics. I'm Peter Watson. And I'm David Steele. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. Now, it's a bit of a twist on legacy this week. I think it's fair to say the ultimate end game for our podcast is Crisis and Infinite Earth, wouldn't mm-hmm. you say, Peter? Yep, absolutely. Which is why, you know, one of the reasons we did Flash 176 recently, was because it kind of foreshadowed certain events from that series, and there's quite a lot of Green Lantern involvement in Crisis and Infinite Earth, although Hal Jordan doesn't appear with it once in the, the no. Tell issue series, it's which is very, bizarre. Very weird, yeah. I like to think he's off having an adventure with a shade and the Golden Age Sandman. <laughs> Some of the Green Lantern action is focused on another Green Lantern from Hal Jordan, a guy called Guy <laughs> called <laughs> Guy Gardner. Now, if you're a similar age to Peter and I, you're probably very familiar with Guy Gardner from his appearances in the Demetrius Giffen and Maguire and Hughes, etc. Justice League series from the late eighties, early nineties. That's mm-hmm. certainly where I first became familiar with Guy Gardner, Green Lantern. Was that when you met him, Peter? Say? Yes, absolutely. Yes, actually, it's probably during the Legends miniseries, which led into the famous Justice League series. But Guy Gardner. One of the other Green Lanterns first appears in issue 59 of Green Lantern, which was published on the 11th of January 1968. As he's become quite an important figure in the Green Lantern mythos, we thought we'd do his first appearance, because he does feature in Crisis, and it means that, you know, when we get to Crisis, we don't have to really explain who he is too much then, because you'll have heard this episode and you know who he is, but he's an important character, and it's a twist on the legacy aspect, because after Hal Jordan, he's the first other Green Lantern of Earth to be introduced in the sort of Silver Age. So that's why we're doing it. Why not, yes. quite frankly? Indeed, yes. Yeah. PC's going to tell us about the amazing cover. Yes. We have Hal Jordan as Green Lantern knocked out down on the ground at the very front of the cover, very dynamic, and standing triumphant over him is another Green Lantern. This chap has got red hair. Gosh, he's a ginger, folks. Yep. And he's holding his mask in his hand. And in his other hand, he has the power battery elevated. And he's saying... Get off this earth, Hal Jordan. There is room for only one Green Lantern. Me. Very, very dynamic. Lots of power, green energy flying out from the power battery. Uh Oh, yes. We're in for a treat, folks. Yep. Bright red logo. It's a beast. And we should mention that the the Hal on the ground is very familiar from the the hero down in front trope from so many Gil Kane Marvel 70s covers. I can Mm -hmm. think of the Beast and Iron Man. I can think of Captain Marvel. I can think of probably Spidey, probably Omega the Unknown, Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Will I put a cover gallery together? Probably not. (laughs) (laughs) You never know. We'll see. I got my copy of GL59 from the late great Peter Root, summer 1993, and it's a very nice copy, I have to say, I have to say. Pete, see, when did you get your copy of Green Lantern 59? I got mine again in the late 80s, and it's off of the wall in AKA Books and Comics in Glasgow. Amazing. So, yes, it's beautiful. It is. Right, okay, so we're going to jump straight in. Opening splash panel. Tiny caption tells us the story by John Broom, the artist by Gil Kane and Sid Green, so we're in safe hands. Our opening splash panel shows a very Roger Moore looking Hal Jordan <laughs> he is. in a blue suit who's sort of gesturing behind him and we can see the Guy Gardner Green Lantern, who we saw on the cover, fighting a few of Green Lantern's regular baddies, including Sinestro and is that Sonar? Is that Shark? Who does look very much like um, Mr. Gargoyle. Yes. <laughs> From one, that Wonder Room story, that, like Indeed, you said. Yes. And I can't make out who that is at the back at all. It's Black Hand. Ah, of course. Here we are, William Hand himself. So, Roger Moore is gesturing backwards, and he has a massive big speech bubble, basically sets the scene for this story, and Hal Jordan says, My name is Hal Jordan, better known to you as Green Lantern. Now, take a look at the guy behind me. He's wearing my uniform, fighting my most formidable foes with my power ring. And yet, I must admit, he has just as much right to that uniform as I have, because he is Earth's other Green Lantern. Tremendous. So, story page two, caption for the first panel says, Transported to Oa for an intensive two-day seminar in the higher techniques of the Guardians, Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern of Earth, is shown many startling wonders. There's a tiny little footnote, asterisk at Oa there, and a little note tells us that Oa is the home of the immortal Guardians of the Universe. Tremendous. This opening panel has Hal Jordan and a couple of Guardians in front of a very impressive, obviously drawn by Gil Kane, piece of equipment. There's a big screen on it and lots of weird metal shapes. First Guardian is saying, And whereas ordinary telescopes can observe scenes on far distant worlds only as they existed years ago, 
This one sees worldly events as they occur now. And the second guardian says, This machine is a memory bank, but a very special one. It stores data taken from brains after death. How Jordan Green Lantern exclaims, After death? It is one of our proudest achievements. We call it mental post-mortems. For example, you may not be aware that we teleported the body of your predecessor, Abin Sir, back here to Oa. Before he was enshrined in the crypt, we recorded Abin Sir's last hours on Earth, taken from his own brain. Would you like to view it? Very much. Delighted how Jordan says there, yes. you, you weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> Caption for the next panel. As a slim cartridge clicks into place in the machine. Yeah, and on the big screen on the machine, Abin Sir's pink face first appears. You see Hal looking up at Abin's face and he thinks, I've always been curious about Abin Sir, who selected me as Green Lantern when he was dying. And on the screen, Abin is saying, when I came to, after crash landing on the planet Earth, I knew that the worst had happened. Hal thinks, This is uncanny, like listening to a voice from the other side of the tomb. In the next few panels, because we're sort of in kind of flashback territory, this first one is heavily rippled, and in the next few pages they're rounded, mm -hmm. just to indicate they were in the past. So this final panel of page two shows Abin Sir on his back, in his own little spaceship, having trouble, because he's back, obviously, the situation he was in when he had to bequeath his ring to Hal, so lying on his back, he's thinking, No use fooling yourself, Abin, sir. You are dying. You only have a short time left to live. Continues at the top of the next page. In this emergency, stricken as you are, you are unable to contact the Guardians. Your duty is clear. Pass on the battery of power to a deserving one. You see that Abin's Green Lantern power battery is beside him, glowing away nicely. Abin is sweating. You get a nice close-up of him in the next panel. He's obviously struggling. He continues to think to himself, you must quickly find on this planet a deserving Earthman. Pass on to him the battery of power. And he narrates the next panel. I press my power ring to the battery beside me. As he does so, he thinks, Battery of power, seek in this world. If there be a deserving one here, seek and find and bring him to me. Abin narrates the next panel. From the ring, a bolt of pure energy crisscrossed the planet with the speed of light. Searching. That's what we see. Very effective. Mm -hmm. He must be one without fear. Entirely without fear. Hurry! The time is short. Where's Mark Murdock then? <laughs> if only if this had been on Earth 616. <laughs> Can you imagine? Has that been done ever? Mark Murdock as a Green Lantern? I don't I think, think so. So when we've written our DC comic for a while and we mend all the, the wars and build the bridges between <laughs> DC and Marvel, we're going to do a comic that has Mark Murdock and Elsewhere Roads for Mark Murdock. Of Lantern. course. It makes sense. Yep. So the final panel, page three, narrated by Abin, says, In hardly more than instance, Thoughts pulse back to me. These are obviously prompts coming from the battery itself. And we see Abin still lying in great pain, and he hears the voice of the battery saying, There are two deserving ones. One is Guy Gardner, an instructor in an eastern school in this country. The other is a test pilot named Hal Jordan in nearby California. Both are identically worthy and free from fear. Top of page four, we get a close-up of Abin. He's thinking, Two, and identically deserving. In that case, I'll select the nearest one. Go! Bring the test pilot back here, swiftly as possible. Abin narrates. The beam darted off again to a certain aircraft hangar at the Ferris Aircraft Company. Yeah, this is the Kraken panel. We see Hal Jordan in his tiny little... <laughs> I've always laughed at this. Yeah. It always strikes me as like a mini submarine in his little... Flight simulator yeah. cockpit thing. Ah, yes. Yeah, that's the best <laughs> word for it. He's in the air and having a great time, and we can see a burst of green energy coming down from the sky behind him. And he's inside his little test bubble type thing, and Hal Jordan's thinking, This flightless trainer will help turn out space pilots of the future. Okay. Abin narrates the next panel, saying, A green glow surrounded the flyer, and... Hal thinks from inside his little device, I'm scooting off at fantastic speeds. How could such an incredible thing happen? As the flight abruptly ended, we see we're back in Abin's spaceship, Hal is coming inside, sees Abin on the ground, and Abin says, and there's a little jagged edge to his speech bubble here, Come in, Hal Jordan. Good gosh! A spaceman in this wrecked spaceship communicating with me by telepathy. Panel 5 then, down near the bottom of the page. We're behind Hal, looking down at Abin, who's obviously in great distress, still sweating away, suffering. Abin says, by telepathy, I am Abin, sir, of a far distant world, and I am dying. There is nothing you can do to help me. Besides, I must speak to you of a more important matter. 
More important than your life? Yes. Look at this object, Hal Jordan. Abin points to his power battery. Hal says... Why, it looks like a green lantern. Aye, sharp, isn't he, Hal Jordan? <laughs> so we're continuing the third page following. We pass um, one advert, now we pass the direct currents page that's in this issue. Oh, I see that it mentions issue three of the Spectre. That's interesting. So, top of page five. Another pained close-up of Abin Sar as he continues. Yes, and those who possess it are known as Green Lanterns. But actually, it is a battery of power, given only to selected individuals on scattered worlds of the cosmos to be used as a weapon against forces of evil and injustice. It is a Green Lantern's duty, when disaster strikes, as it has struck me, to pass on the battery of power to another who is fearless and honest. Come closer to me. You see Hal leaning in, looking very concerned, he's paying attention. Mm -hmm. And Abin gestures with his ring, bathing Hal in a green light, and Abin says, Yes, by the beam of my ring, I see that you are honest. And the battery has already selected you as one born without fear. So, you pass both tests, Hal Jordan. Abin narrates the next panel. There was still much to tell him, and only moments remained to me. I described how my ship was battered in a freakish concentration of the intense radiation bands surrounding his planet. And we see Abin's ship. I've always been struck by the fact that Abin mm -hmm. travels around in a spaceship. Because you're quite used to a lot of Green Lanterns, yeah. you know, interstellar travel, just doing a bit of wing alone. There is a story, like, much later on that deals with that. I'm a right thing, there's a bit of a retcon, isn't it? You yeah. kind of add some more elements to mm -hmm. it, so that it's not just a, an accident of yeah, yellow uh -huh. radiation. Yeah. It's, it's destiny, almost. Aye. Yeah, uh -huh. It's kind of what Big Finish did with the Sixth Doctor, with Colin Baker's last adventure, when they kind of mm -hmm. melded that into Time and the Rani. Yeah. There's a deep cut, listeners. Hope you get that <laughs> reference. Panel four, as we say, shows Abin's spaceship being struck by the yellow energy, and his narration continues in the final panel. How a terrible blast of yellow light, similar to the Aurora Borealis, blinded me at the controls of the ship and caused me to crash helplessly to the surface of his world. This panel has Abin recoiling from the yellow energy inside the spaceship. Top of page six now. Abin continues to narrate, gathering my forces, fighting to breathe. I managed to impart to him certain necessary information. So, sweaty Abin, because that's what I'm calling him now, continues to say to Hal. Only moments left to tell you. Once you have the battery, you will have power over everything, except what is yellow. The unique metal which charges the battery with its wondrous power has a yellow impurity in it. Strangely enough, if the impurity is removed, the battery loses its power. It is this impurity in the battery which makes it powerless against anything yellow. Hal replies, I, I understand. So the next panel shows Abin's hand in the process of slipping the power ring onto Hal's own finger. Abin continues. Now, take my ring. Let me put it on you. With this ring, you will drain power from the battery. Effective for 24 hours, then you must recharge it at the battery, vowing each time to use it against the forces of evil. Now, I've told you all. Do not fail my trust. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. You see Hal holding Abinsar's hand. In the next panel, Hal, eyes wide, exclaims, Gone! He breathed his last. Final flashback panel ripples as we return to the present. The caption of the next panel says, As the cartridge clicks to a stop. And we see Hal Jordan, one of the Guardians, looking up at the screen. Hal says, Incredible! That's the way I became a Green Lantern. At the time, I thought I had given myself that name, but actually it was planted in my mind by Abinsur. After his death, I donned a special uniform he left me, and in exuberance, I tried out my power ring for the first time. Another tiny flashback here, showing Hal operating his power ring, lifting a massive big chunk of rock into the air. As he does this, he thinks, Lifting a cliff into the air? I can do anything I want with this ring. Anything I will to happen, I can make happen. That tiny flashback ends, top of page 7 now. Hal is with the Guardians. And he says, But what astonishes me, there was a chance that another Earthman could have been chosen to be a Green Lantern. I can't help wondering what would have happened if this other man, the schoolteacher Guy Gardner, had been selected by Abin Sur. Well, the Guardians replies, We can show you what would have happened. You, you can? Indeed. In front of, I think it's a different machine. It yep. also has a big screen on it. But there's a real... Kirby influence mm. to some of the, the tech here. I mm -hmm. wonder if Gail just sat and copied it or maybe just breathed it in. I mean, you could argue there's some similarities between yeah, their work anyway. The style at the time. Yeah, yeah. Aye, aye, that's probably fair. Mm. So in front of another machine, as I say, also has a screen on it. One of the Guardians continues. Indeed, 
This machine can compose different possibilities in the future, based on alternate postulates of events. He continues here directing one of his colleagues, Let us demonstrate Ka by screening the answer to his question. And then we see the close-up hands of one of the other guardians operating the equipment of this other machine they're in front of, and he says, The proper information has now been programmed into the computer core. We will start it at the hypothetical moment that Guy Gardner, instead of yourself, would have been contacted by the stricken Abin Sur. The machine will act as narrator. Well, that's handy. So, the next panel has a little insert caption, which, <laughs> in a similar way to the, you know, we've had the disembodied heads of characters <laughs> narrating events, we have the screen, tiny shot of the screen, <laughs> because the computer's going to narrate it. I'll leave it up to Peter if he's going to do a computer voice for his narrations. Yeah. So, the computer narration then starts and it says, Blocked from his post at school, the physical education instructor Guy Gardner was whisked across the country. Yep, there's a slight flashback ripple to this panel as we see Guy Gardner being whisked along in a little burst of green energy, obviously directed by, by Abin. So Guy is wearing a white vest, purple trousers and brown socks and boots. He must have maybe just got up that morning. Maybe mm-hmm. he was just shaving. I don't know. But anyway, he's not really dressed. And as Guy is being swept along, he's thinking, I'm in the grip of something that's not of this world. Huh? That looks like an alien spacecraft. Wrecked. And then a voice from inside a spaceship says, In here, Guy Gardner. The narration continues. Soon. And we're once again at the scene that we saw earlier on with Abin Sir. And it must be said, Guy, you know, in his first panel there, it was shown as having red hair, but this final panel on page seven, <laughs> it shows a guy with brown hair. Yeah. <laughs> They've done a great job of substituting Hal Jordan. Maybe, into... maybe he's just in shadow. Yes. Could be. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so again, Abin Sir is honing his ring up to Guy Gardner. And he's saying, you are honest and born without fear. Use this ring as Green Lantern against evil and injustice. Guy replies, I promise. I will do my best. Narration continues at the top of page 8. After the death of Abin Sur, the new Green Lantern took over his uniform and tried his wings, falteringly at first. This panel shows Guy struggling to learn how to fly, like in that Tom Petty song, with his power ring, zooming along and then colliding with the ground, thinking, Oof! I can't get the hang of this ring. It's so powerful, yet it can suddenly lose force. And then he's flying again in the next panel, thinking, I see what was wrong. I must will the ring to act properly. I've got to keep backing it with my willpower without a letdown. As he zooms off, he continues to think, What a feeling! Terrific! Fantastic! So, the narration continues in the next panel. Guy resumed his normal life, concealing the thoughts that now raced through his mind. Yeah, we see him in the, probably the school gymnasium on the rings demonstrating to some pupils what needs to be done. And he's thinking, no one shall know that I now have a secret identity. The most important part of my life takes place when I don my Green Lantern uniform. By the numbers! One, two! He starts to swing on the rings. The narration continues. His first case came during a rash of sabotage in East City. See Guy reading the newspaper. Newspaper, it was just called News. That's a very, very interesting title there. It's to the point, isn't it? Very (laughs) matter-of-fact. No no messing about. No imagination, obviously. No. Maybe things are quite straightforward in this city. So guys reading the newspaper. The headline says, Saboteurs strike again. Arms factory bombed. Guys thinking, Green Lantern is going to take a crack at these saboteurs. That night, as the Emerald Crusader scoured the city. You see Guy in Green Lantern uniform flying down towards a big house. He's thinking, my rings detected a hidden radio transmitter in this locality, coming from that house. Instants later, a green-clad projectile speared through solid walls. Yeah, with a crash, guy bursts into a room. And there's some bad guys, the no traditional sort of bad guys that we're used to seeing in stories of this era. (laughs) Three of them in suits. One of them's got black hair. One hasn't. One's got a striped suit. Two of them haven't. One of them's baldy. Anyway, but the guy in the purple suit whirls around and says... Two more factories destroyed, Commander, huh? This guy crashes through the wall. He thinks, my first job. I better not muff it. Top of page nine, narration says, The enemy agents had never confronted anyone like Green Lantern before. They thought bullets could stop him. And big-nosed, purple-suited, black-haired goon exclaims, Kill him! He mustn't leave here alive! Yeah, when the three bodies are now firing their guns, a guy. I love the, I love the fact that he's standing right in front of this massive hole in the wall. It's a great <laughs> panel. Guy's got a little shield up generated by his power ring. And this prompts 
baldy orange suit wearing bad guy to exclaim, This guy's another Superman. He whipped out a shield. That's stopping our bullet short. The narration says for the next panel. Then Gardner hurled himself forward. This guy does so, punching out goons, he thinks. I don't trust myself yet to use my ring directly on these saboteurs. I might crash them to a pulp. I want to turn them over to the authorities for questioning. Alive. Punches out blue suit goon in the next panel, thinking, I'm in tip-top condition, as a physical education teacher should be. He ducks out the way of purple suit guys punch in the next panel, thinking, But I can't say the same for my foes. They're flabby with poor reflexes. And with a clop, final panel of page nine, guy sends the purple suit bad guy flying, thinking, Fight's over. I'll scoop him up in a power ring net and hand him over to the FBI. Tremendous. The narration for the full page splash at page 10 says, After that, he took on a series of super criminals. One after another, they arose to challenge him, pitting their evil force against his willpower and ring and love of justice. Yep, great panel showing Guy in an action pose, gesturing and firing his ring, surrounded by several key Green Lantern bad guys who all get identified little caption boxes and pointing arrows. So first of all, we have... Sonar, Sultan of Supersonic Sound. Then... The Shark, Prayer on Human Beings. And a shifty headshot of the next guy. Black Hand, the cliché criminal. Then down in the bottom left-hand corner, gesturing up with bolts of lightning. Dr. Polaris, Master of Magnetism. Then a final headshot of a bad guy who we've already met in the podcast, leering and looking very evil indeed. It's... Last, but not least, Sinestro, the renegade Green Lantern. Terrific. Over the page then, top of page 11. It was after Guy Gardner's resounding defeat of Sinestro that the Guardian summoned him to Oa and revealed to him the source of the mystic power which had been conferred on him when he power-ringed homeward again. That's very interesting. It sort of struck me that I think the same happened to Hal. It was ages before he actually met the Guardians. Yeah. The Emerald Dawn sort of reboot kind of did away with, really, yeah. didn't it? Mm-hmm. I thought that was crazy. You would just be left mucking <laughs> along independently, you know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so we're outside the, the flashback at this point of the story. We're with Hal Jordan and the Guardian, who are back to watching the events shown on the screen. Hal Jordan is saying, An astonishing account. So far, his career very closely parallels my own. Or would have. Wait. I notice he's taking a different route back to Earth, one I never took. The Guardian comments, Perhaps this change will be significant. Let us see. So the narration resumes, the next panel saying, The change came with explosive suddenness. So this panel shows Guy out in space, above a very Earth-like planet, it must be said. And there are many bursts of jaggedy orange energy all around him. And this is prompting Guy to think, Bursts of high-powered energy exploding all around me. They're coming from that isolated planet ahead of me. It might be worth a Green Lantern investigation. Uh-oh. Well, the next panel, which is dissected diagonally with the one I've just described. Mm-hmm. Quite interesting. The guy has entered the planet's atmosphere. He's flying down, and he's thinking and observing. By the galaxies, a fantastic duel between antagonists armed with radiation weapons. It was those stray blasts from the battle that almost struck me. And we see what looks like a blue armoured figure fighting an orange armoured figure. The blue suited figure is firing sort of red energy. The orange-suited fellow is firing orange energy from his gun. As Guy draws closer, he says, I wonder if I should mix in. And then, well, (laughs) Guy helps us out here. He continues by thinking in the next panel, That answers my question. They're turning their weapons on me. Sure enough, both of the aliens that he's just seen fighting down on the ground, stunning the yellow sand, fire both of their guns up at him. The orange-armoured figure exclaims, Intruder! The one in the blue says, Destroy him! The narration then continues at the top of page 12. Instantly, Gardner's great green beam flared out at his attackers with overpowering potency. It's a very dynamic panel showing the two armoured figures recoiling, dropping their guns as Guy fires a power beam at them. Guy's thinking, their ray guns are no match for my power beam. Great guardians, my ring is informing me that these two are robots, highly complex automatons. But why were they fighting? Who made them? I've got to get to the bottom of this. Tiny caption says, story continues on third page following. Over the page, we have the letters page for the issue. We have a full page advertisement for the, the Creeper's first appearance in Showcase. Oh, well, that's, that's quite interesting. interesting. Yes. We will meet the Creeper eventually, kids. Don't worry. Mm-hmm. Don't worry. A new star on the DC horizon. Steve Ditko strikes again. When did you first encounter the Creeper? 
in uh, Brave and Bold team up where he fought the origami monster. Right, I know the one you mean. Which was great. I know the one you mean, it's a cracker. I think that the first time I encountered him was an earlier Brave and Bold, mm -hmm. which had a human target backup strip. Ah, uh -huh, okay, yes. Because it's the... Oh, another one you mean. White cover. White cover, yeah. Because yeah, uh -huh. I think that it was the human target aspect that kind of lingered in my head. We mentioned the Giffen Maguire, Demetrius, Justice League, obviously, which featured Guy Gardner and stuff. Mm. And the Creeper turned up in that, and I was getting those issues. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I know this guy. And my memory of him was from that issue, Brave and Bold, because the human... Tar I remember asking my dad, yeah. how would you be a human target? Does that mean <laughs> he can turn into a target? And of course, my dad, who also told me the reason Batman wore gloves and Clark Kent didn't wear gloves was that Batman's day job ran the risk of him leaving fingerprints, but Clark Kent didn't run the risk of leaving fingerprints anywhere. And, and I was like, all right, okay. And my dad also told me at an early age that the thing was just something else that the Hulk turned into. So <laughs> so there you go. Maybe my dad wasn't the best man to ask about the human target. So we passed the advertisement for the Creeper. And as I say, we all meet the Creeper. He's going to team up with Wildcat eventually. Mm -hmm. We arrive at the top of page 13. And a caption box that says, Earth's Other Green, Green Lantern, Lantern, Part 2. And the Owen Guardian Machine continues its narration. Having swiftly disarmed his mechanical foes, the ring wielder probed their computer brains. We see Guy scanning the two robots. And the orange one says, This planet Gura is inhabited only by children. They are the only humans here. Guy exclaims, Children? The blue robot continues, Yes, children who never grow old. Aeons ago, their gear and parents who made us were wiped out by a terrible yellow plague. Somehow only the children remained immune to the disease, but it had a strange effect on them. It arrested their growth. They never grew older. Guy interjects, saying, That's against all the laws of nature. The robot continues, Hungry for recreation. The ageless children began playing war games. They divided into two armed camps. One side, mine, choosing orange for its distinctive colour. While my side chose blue. Each side is continually trying to annihilate the other. As a result, this world is always at war. Gosh, why don't they just have a pop concert instead? <laughs> anyway, the narration continues with the next panel. Leaving the robot pair immobilised by his beam, the ring wielder flew onward across the planet of youth. Ah, Planet of Youth. I think that's a Swede B-side. <laughs> Certainly sounds like a Swede B-side, does doesn't actually. it? So, yeah, we see Guy bombing about, frankly, around some more Gil Kane, big sci-fi looking cityscape stuff. Quite a lot of yellow going on here. Mm. And obviously, he mentioned a terrible yellow plague, so we should probably think about that. That if you, if you mention a terrible yellow plague on page 13, what could possibly happen? So as Guy's bombing about, he says, I must try to end the war here and bring peace. Then he thinks, without parents to guide them, the children here have run wild. They don't realise that war and destruction are evil. Reminds me of several Star Trek episodes. Oh, yes. Top of page 14, a couple of deceptive panels of Guy flying around, thinking, I'm sure I can get the children to listen to reason. I'll bring both sides together and make peace. Ah, a powerful thought wave reaching me. And sure enough, at the bottom of this panel, there's a little jagged thought bubble, speech bubble, that says, This one is strong willpower. The other half of this deceptive panel, we see Guy, it's almost like he's been directed. He's swooping around and he's thinking, Some force seeking to control my mind. Got to resist with all my willpower. The narration for the next panel. Despite all his efforts, Gardner succumbed to the uncanny mental attack. This panel shows Guy with his arms by his sides, obviously being directed by the, the mental force that's been drawn against him. And he's been brought down towards a bunch of the children, all dressed in blue. One little boy cries, We've captured it! How exciting! There's one blonde-haired kid who seems to be guiding Guy. He has a hand outstretched, directing it. Using the force? Yeah. And another boy behind him says, Careful, Gore. Bring it down carefully. Don't damage it. So Gore must be the blonde lad then. So the narration for the next panel, final panel of page 14, says, And shortly afterward... You see Guy, he's sort of been secured in a very Gil Kane fancy-looking chair. Lots of kids all throwing you around, trying to see what's going on. Guy's thinking, the kid's clamouring all around me. They think I'm some new robot toy. And I can't move. I can't lift a finger. And one of the kids, the boy with the brown hair who was speaking to Gore a moment ago, says, It's better than anything we have. It's just like a living thing. Some super race must have made it. 
Contact with the Brain Centre informs me it is called Green Lantern. Contact with the Brain Centre is actually a track on Blur's Park Life album. Yes, I was thinking that exact same joke. <laughs> <laughs> Logopolis there, ladies and gentlemen. You see, in many ways we have the same mind. So we're now at the top of page 15 and the narration says... Under absolute control of the blue cohorts of Gera, the toy crusader was given a grim mission. Yes, and this panel shows Guy still being secured. And one of the kids, one of the ones in blue, he's saying to Guy. And you will seek out the orange army and help us defeat it with your terrific power ring. Then all the orangers must be taken prisoner. Is that clear? Guy's thinking, too clear. They've drafted me into their army. So one of the kids gestures and releases Guy in the next panel. The kid's saying, Go, Green Lantern! Carry out your assignment to the best of your ability! As Guy flies off, he thinks, I have no choice. So, exception for the next panel says, Thus Gardener found himself forced to take part in the planet-wide deadly serious war game of the children. He was still over the city when suddenly... Yeah, this is great. Imagine a sort of giant robotic orange owl creature Mm. flying down towards Guy as he zooms over the the sci-fi cityscape. One of the kids cries from down below. A bear craft of the orange enemy. Shoot it down, Green Lantern. Another one says, Hurry before it can attack us. Narration for the next panel. The mystic beam swept out, created a mighty mountain before the winged ship, and... Yes, there's a massive kaboom sound effect because Guy has used his power ring to will a cliff into existence and the orange robot bird has collided with it and exploded open. Guy gestures and says, Phew, that's a relief. My ring informs me there's nothing alive in there. It's all robot controlled. Okay, interesting. And the kids down the ground are delighted because they cry, <laughs> Continued in second page following. The opposite page is an advertisement for issue 200 of Batman. That's quite nice. Nice colour. Showing other cover images, including Robin Dies at Dawn, mm-hmm. which we might do maybe one day somehow if we can think about of a reason to do it, because it's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it'll be the 2023 Christmas special. Maybe. So we're now at the top of page 16. And the Owen narration continues. The war game took place everywhere on Gera, even under the sea, where shortly his diminutive masters dispatched their new toy to seek and destroy a fantastic adversary. Guy's underwater, surrounded by protective green halo, and he's been sent by his controllers to fight a robot fish. Mm. Big metallic looking robot fish, Gil Kane style robot fish. If you can imagine a big robotic Gil Kane style Robotic fish, it probably looks exactly like what we're looking at here. Did you ever read Gil Kane's Undersea Agent? No, I don't think I did. Yeah, that's got similar stuff to this. Interesting. So, pop to my head there. Okay. There we go. I've seen copies of the comic on the wall at various comic marks, but mm-hmm. because it wasn't published by anyone that I knew, I don't think yeah, I ever. Yeah, there was a hardcover one. collection of it fairly recently. Right. In our sense. <laughs> in our sense, yeah. Right, and okay. within, within the last 10 years. Right, interesting. Which is quite nice. Cool. So, yes, as we say, guys on the water, there's some bolts of purple lightning all around them. Pinky purple lightning, I should say, really. And Guy's thinking, a submarine in the shape of a huge fish, hurling lightning bolts at me. I've not only got to defend myself, I have to come up with an effective counter-attack of my own. Just another diagonally dissected Mm -hmm. cover panels here. Nice work from Mr. Kane. The narration for the next one says, For a while it seemed as if the spellbound gladiator was doomed to fail against his monstrous, ominous adversary. Guy's been struck by the pink lightning and he's thinking, Those bolts drive me back. Hardly giving me a chance to whip up my willpower. The narration for the next panel. Then, sheer concentration unleashed a blast of emerald energy so overwhelming that... Guy strikes out with his power ring, big blast of energy, collides with the robot fish submarine, and Guy's thinking, I've shattered its defences. It's out of control, quivering and shaking under the impact of internal explosions. Now to make sure it stays out of action. It's off of page 17 then. The narration says... With the aid of his great beam, the guy, Green Lantern, lifted the enormous fish-shaped craft entirely out of the water. Guy is gesturing with his power ring. Dynamic work from Gil Kane. It's unmistakable who's drawn this. It's phenomenal. His gesture increases a giant left hand, which has lifted the robot fish submarine out of the water, holding it above the rocks and stuff. Guy is exclaiming, If there's one place a submarine will be out of action, it's high and dry here on this hilltop. A little jaggedy voice, obviously coming from one of the kids, says, Well done, Green Lantern. You're ready for the next move. A direct attack on the land forces of the Orangers. 
There's an insert panel showing Guy flying down, and the kid's voice continues. Press on at once! We want total victory! Guy's thinking, the blue kids still have control over me. Isn't there any way I can shake off their domination of my mind? Gosh. Top of page 18, the narration continues. Like a remote control toy, the emerald-garbed crusader swept deeper into the fray. Yeah, now, we did Metal Man issue 30 very recently, mm-hmm. and there was a giant weird robot dragon. The Mechan monster. Yeah, and this looks very like it. It does. Except it's got another head, and it's orange. Gail yeah. must have been having a great time at this point. The midsection of it looks like a car. Yeah, <laughs> it does. It's really peculiar. It kind of looks like one of the Transformers, you know, like one of the Dinobots or something. Yeah, or, or kind of one of the even later ones when they missed the point of just turning them into regular yeah. identifiable vehicles. Yeah, mm. it's very strange. You know, you can imagine a going on. But anyway, this giant two-headed robotic caterpillar tread, tentacle tailed robot dragon is firing red flames out of its two respective mouths. And as Guy tries to dodge the flames, he's thinking, I'd be in a terrible mess if these dragon-like tanks were yellow instead of orange. And we get a little jaggedy caption speech bubble which tells us the kids are communicating with him, saying Destroy the warrior sent against us by the Bluers! Yes, yeah, so that's the the orange kids this time. The narration caption for the next panel says, The Green Gladiator's battle plan was simplicity itself. Fight fire with fire. We see Guy gesturing with his ring. It's not so much a green flame that's coming out of it, just a kind of jaggedy green, but it's having the effect. It's deflecting the flames that's being fired out by the giant dragon robot tank. There's a jaggedy speech bubble, because obviously one of the kids is saying, Aye! Our tank's being devoured by their own tongues of flame! Yes. So we're at top of page 19 now. The narration says, In desperation, the orange children sought to wrest control of Green Lantern from their blue foes. Yes, the blue foes. Not to be confused with the the Hulk villains that were very popular and based on the Fantastic Four. So Mm. we're with the orange kids now. They kind of remind me of a bunch of karate kid cosplayers here, (laughs) Yes, actually. There's a little blonde guy. There's a curly brown haired kid. The curly brown haired kid is gesturing toward Green Lantern. A couple of mental orange bolts of energy coming from his fingers. He's trying to take control. The yellow haired orange outfitted kid says, Arm! Contact their Warriors Control Center! Dominate it! Yep. And Guy is now thinking, Great Guardians! I'm caught now in a mental tug of war! He gets a close up in the next panel as he thinks, ah, If this keeps up, it'll shatter my mind! The two-way pressure, mounting every instant. So, yellow-haired kid is crying, Harder! Arm! We also hear the voice of one of the blue controlling kid's colleagues saying, Keep control, Gore! Yeah, we can see orange lightning bolts on one side of the panel, blue lightning bolts on the other as guys being struck. Guys thinking, Whoever wins this battle, I lose. Unless I can use this clash of super mentalities to free myself. Here goes! With every erg of willpower I can summon up to activate my ring! Caption for the next panel. Then keyed up by the resolve to save his life and bring peace to this planet of war-minded children. Guy cries, did it! We see a burst of green energy from his power ring as he shoots up out of the way of the two conflicting, contrasting bolts of mental force. Guy's thinking, deflected both mental beams, forced them to clash into each other, leaving me momentarily free of either one's influence. Well done, Guy! Amazing! There's another couple of diagonally dissected panels here. Caption for the next one says, In that moment of freedom, he coated himself with power ring armour. And that's exactly what we see. Guy's power ring is flaring and he's now wearing a set of green armour, which reminds me very much of the outfits that everyone wore towards the end of Justice, the Alex Ross Mm -hmm. painted series from about 20 years ago now, probably. Indeed. Which was nice to look at. (laughs) I can't remember who wrote it, actually. Written by Jim Kruger, I think it was. Yep, Dougie Braithwaite was involved. Did he pencil it and then Alex Ross drew over it? But yeah, it was a very cynical attempt to sell action figures, if you ask me. (laughs) So, back to the story of this. Now, armoured Guy Gardner, Green Lantern, is thinking, There, that ought to withstand even the most powerful mental energy. From now on, this Green Lantern knight is under nobody's control. Wow. Over the page, top of page 20, the narration continues. Free to act on his own, Gardner lost no time in pacifying the planet. In this task, his long experience as a public school instructor on Earth stood him in good stead. Yes, so we see armoured Guy standing, surrounded by kids. One of the orange kids, it looks like Orm, the boy who was trying to take control of Guy early in the story. He's standing with a couple of kids in blue outfits. And armoured Green Lantern says, Beginning today, children of Gera, let your games be games of enjoyable sport and exercise, not of hateful war. Orm says, 
Green Lantern is right, Gore. Our war games were silly and stupid. Gore replies, I'm glad it's over, Orm. Our toy turned out to be a human, and a wise human at that, like a father. Next panel shows Orm and Gore shaking hands. Oh, you know, good job, guy. Well done. And as Green Lantern stands in the background, he thinks, I've used my power beam to make all the children of Gera normal again. They will grow up now and become adults. And in time, they'll have children of their own. How did he do that? Powering. Um, Amazing. Okay. Yeah. Just casually rewrote DNA for the entire population. It's fine. Uh, yeah, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I'm not... I'm not too worried about it, but just, you know... Maybe a shot of him in a laboratory or something <laughs> would have helped. So <laughs> This PE teacher with the yeah. science manual. Well, exactly. You know, so, I mean, hmm. all teachers and everything. So Gore and the Orm are shaking hands and Gore is saying, As Green Lantern said, let this shaking of hands be a sign of friendship. So in this next panel, it's um, Gore and Orm both speaking to Guy and Gore is saying, Green Lantern, we've decided on a new flag for Gera. Then Orm continues, With blue and orange colours. And Gore says, to symbolise that we've joined together, Orm concludes, and won't fight each other anymore. Hooray! And then Guy says as he walks off in the next panel, that my job here is done. And Gore says, Goodbye, Green Lantern. Please come back for a visit. Terrific. Well, happy ending. Well done, Guy. So, final panel of page 20. Fantastic panel by Gil Kane with Guy leaving that planet and zooming off into space. The narration says, Shortly the green-clad crusader zoomed skyward whence he had come. As he flies off, guys, saying, I will come back one of these days and check on the children to make sure they're all right. But right now I've got to hurry. It's almost 24 hours since I last charged my ring on Oa. Got to get back to Earth before I'm stranded there. Top of page 21. He made it, all right, and with his last shreds of green energy reached his power battery. Wow, now this is good. It's a great moody shot of Guy charging his ring and he's uttering his oath. Now, listen to this. On worlds afar, or scenes at home, wherever the cause should make me roam, always I vow to fight the good fight, to combat evil with all Green Lantern's might. Wowza. Awesome. That was good, wasn't it? Yeah. Brand new oath. Yeah. Very exciting. It is exciting. That panel will go on the socials, I mm -hmm. think. And I wonder if I'll be able to learn it and recite it in the <laughs> privacy of my own home. Who can say, however, after that excitement, the narration for the next panel. But hardly had he uttered the oath when a terrible change came over him and he began to shake uncontrollably. Yes, we see Guy looking in a mirror, sweat pouring from his face as he observes, Can't breathe. I've turned all yellow. And indeed, his skin has turned bright yellow. The caption for the next panel. Suddenly, he realised what had occurred. Guy is collapsing to the ground, one arm on his dresser, trying to keep himself from falling, and he's thinking, On Gera, somehow, I caught the yellow plague. My ring can't help me. Nothing can help me. I have only a short while left to live, and I know what I must do. The narration for the next panel. As had the dying Abin Sir before him, Gardner in extremity found the strength to shoot out his power beam. Search for a deserving one. Bring him to me. Find one who is honest and born without fear. Go. Hurry. Guy's gesturing, bolt of energy flying from his ring, the narration for the next panel. Fast as light, the beam sped across country and returned with the deserving one it had selected. Guy, some helpful CBC dialogue here at this crucial moment as he says, my ring informs me, this young test pilot is destined to become my successor, the new Green Lantern of Earth. And being born in, in a burst of energy, in his overalls, Guy says, Hal Jordan, listen to me. I am about to die. Afterward, you will take my ring and uniform. As Green Lantern, you will combat evil. Hal Jordan cuts in and exclaims, Green Lantern? Close up of Guy looking very pained. Sweat pouring from him as he struggles to communicate what he has to. Yes, you have been chosen. In time, you will be contacted by our masters, the Guardians. There is your power battery. In charging your ring, it is proper for you to take an oath. I will teach you my... I... Oh! The next panel shows Hal Jordan holding Guy Gardner's hand. Hal is thinking, he, he died before he could tell me his oath. I'll have to make up one of my own. I'll take the ring from his finger now, charge it as he said. The narration for the next panel. With words that came to him, Hal Jordan charged the power ring. Yep, moody shot here of Hal with the ring to the lantern. And Hal is saying, 
in brightest day and blackest night. No evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power. Green Lantern's light. Fantastic. There's a slight ripple to this panel as we're returning to normal for the present day and the narration from the computer on Oa concludes with... And thus a new Green Lantern was born. See the Guardian and Hal watching Hal flying away on the screen. The Guardian says to Hal, and there you have it, Green Lantern of Earth. You have seen what would have happened if the other deserving one on your planet had been selected by Abin Sir. Astonishing, Hal thinks in the next panel. It seems I was fated to become Green Lantern one way or another. Hal then says to the Guardian, I should like to make the acquaintance of Guy Gardner, if it is permitted. A smiling Guardian replies, Permission granted. So, caption then for the next panel. Back on Earth, not long afterward. And we see Guy Gardner and Hal Jordan. Hal's wearing a blue suit, Guy's wearing a horrendous check jacket <laughs> and a blue tie. And they're leaving the place, and there's a sign obviously behind Guy that says Athletic Club. Guy's saying, Then you travel a lot, Hal. That's right, Guy. I used to be a test pilot, but now I work for an insurance company. I'll only be here in your town for a week or two. And we're over the page now to the last page of the story, page 23. Hal thinks, It wasn't hard to make Guy's acquaintance. I simply joined this athletic club of which he's a member, and it didn't take us long to become good friends. <laughs> right, okay. Guy says to Hal, Know something, Hal? I've got the strangest feeling we've met somewhere before, under other circumstances. I just can't seem to remember. Hal thinks, How could he? It never really happened. I wish I could tell Guy how close he came to becoming Green Lantern, but I can't. And the final caption then for the final panel. Soon, a parting of the ways. See that Hal's boarding an aircraft, a very attractive purple outfitted stewardess behind him. It's an attractive red-haired lady following Hal up the steps into the plane. Maybe Hal. it's Carrie Limbo. Could be. <laughs> Guy, still wearing that horrible jacket, standing down on the ground, waving off to Hal. And Hal is thinking as he waves back, I'll keep in touch with him. It isn't often in life that you come across someone like Guy Gardner. You may not have seen each other before, but we'll see each other again. I'll make sure of that. The, the end. end. Well then, there's a little caption after this that says, See Green Lantern on your local CBS TV station every Saturday morning. Yep, that may no longer be accurate, but there you go. Well <laughs> then, the first appearance of Guy Gardner. That was very, very, very exciting. Very satisfying. Yeah. Very clean, very linear. Yep. Rattled along at a great pace. It was also a great way to retell Hal's origin in the first place as well. Yeah. Which is good because a lot of the start of that was taken up by his origin story. And then basically they did exactly the same except just inserted Guy into it. Mm -hmm. So really nice, easy story for John Broom to, to, yeah. <laughs> to churn out there. Yeah. But a nice twist to it. It's a bit of a what if in a way, isn't mm, it? Yeah. We've got a rule about not doing imaginary stories, mm -hmm. and obviously, and it's kind of an imaginary story, but not really. And it's great, just another way of introducing another Green Lantern. So, yeah, your further thoughts then? Oh, I've got loads of them. Found it quite unusual that there's actually a Guardian named in the story. Yes. That's, that's something you don't have yeah. every issue. Yeah, we get used to Ganthet later on, but mm -hmm. at this stage, it wasn't very common at all, was it? Yeah. And again, in the recap of Hal's origin, there's something that always bugs me. Hal lives in Earth 1, and we know on Earth 1, comics exist about the Earth 2 characters. Right. So, does Hal know about Alan Scott, Green Lantern? When he first says, oh, your power battery, it's like a Green Lantern. It's, he doesn't think, oh, that's like that comic character. That's a fair point. Does Hal strike you as a sort of guy that be aware of comic books? No, but I'm sure that other people might be. Yeah, know? but I kind of think, like, you know, whereas we know that Barry was a, a geek mm -hmm. and had his own collection, I think Hal yeah. maybe probably thought kid stuff and maybe... But then the same thing might have happened with Guy mm -hmm. and said, oh, Green Lantern, like the comic character. Yeah, I suppose. That didn't occur to me, to be honest. You know, it could well be the case, I suppose, when Hal's saying it. He has been influenced by Alan Scott or, mm -hmm. or what have you. It's, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I found it hilarious that Guy says that as a physical education teacher, he has to be in tip-top shape. Now, if Guy had been a <laughs> physical education teacher at my high school... None of those guys <laughs> were in any kind of physical shape. Uh, <laughs> yeah. One of them was particularly burly and used to basically pick one of the boys in the class to demonstrate gymnastics yeah, <laughs> as opposed to yeah, do anything himself. Things must have been different in America as opposed to what they were like <laughs> in West Central Scotland. Well, you know, 
our high school in the 80s merged with another high school mm. and they pensioned off our middle-aged stroke elderly men who'd been terrorising us. You know, we got you yeah. know a couple of much younger guys who were a little, little more lively and mm. the girls all fancied, certainly, compared to the, <laughs> the elderly men we'd had previously. Mm. I think it's a good, not an image, a good example. It's sort of, you know, it's a good thing to sort of have rather than a confident, arrogant test pilot. Let's have a fit teacher that maybe is almost a better role model in yeah. some ways. You know, it's, it's mm. good sort of showing him as being active and stuff. I liked that part. It was good. The shot of him in the rings is good because... We're so used to Guy as we know him from coming to him in the mid late eighties when yeah. he was you know that whole well we, Guy will come back in the podcast yeah. so we're not going to say too much about what happens to him before mm-hmm. then but you know he's he's quite cocksure quite arrogant yeah you know almost a caricature in a lot of ways the late eighties early nineties version of him mm-hmm. so we're used to that so it's interesting seeing this detail of his life that he was actually a good guy as opposed to a bit of a dick. Yeah, you know, which is what we're used to him from. Mm-hmm. A couple of other things as well. The idea of Abin Sur's body being sent back to Oa. Now, has he not got any family? That struck me as well because I wanted to sort of comment on the fact that we're all familiar with the, the image of Hal burying Abin's body under yeah. a pile of rocks. And the, the headstone says R.I.P. Abin Sur. And I, for years, when I was a kid, I used to think his full name was Rip Abin Sur. Right. <laughs> yeah, the, the Guardians exhumed him. <laughs> Dug him up. Yeah. <laughs> is that how they found out about Hal? Is, you know, maybe they get some alert that yeah. Abed had died and they transported his body back and then, who knows? It's very strange. It's very strange. Abin Sir did have a sister called Aaron Sir, who I think it's something to do with the Blackest Night sort of period was involved in letting you know the Indigo tribe or the Black Lantern. I can't remember. Oh, okay. It's a long time. Right. So there was something of that and I'm sure that probably did feed into the story. Uh-huh. And he did have a son called Amon Sir. Ah, of course. Who ended up in the the Sinestro Corps got killed off and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, there's a little bit of stuff about Abin's family. And his own legacy. Yeah, I mean, but obviously all that all that was kind of added in years and years and years after yeah. the, the stuff that we were talking about. Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember a Western story with him in the Legends, Legends of the, the DC, DC Universe either. comic, which, you know, the, he, he was exploited is maybe the harsh word for mm-hmm. it, but you know, there, there have been more Abin's stuff stories, which is, yeah. which is cool. And of course the Flashpoint universe. Yeah. Uh, Abin's story was the Green Lantern, yeah. so yeah. So Abin Sir, he casts a long shadow. Now, I mean, my main sort of takeaway from this was the, the fascination I had the, I developed towards the end with the, the blue kids and the orange kids. Mm-hmm. Reminded me of the blue and the green from the Tomorrow People, but also from oh, yes. the, the... I mean, the colours quite don't match up, but with the horrible sectarian aspect you get living in Glasgow yeah, between right, Rangers right. fans and Celtic yeah. fans. <laughs> it put me in mind a little bit of that. A much more innocent version yes, of... it was very yeah. hopeful. They just send robots at each other. I like the fact that Guy was able to reconcile them, but that whole thing of being an alien planet and there's been a long war and then reconcile yeah. it, it reminds me of the adventures of the Human League in Outer Space from Viz Comic, where... Phil and the girls land on a planet and the aliens are fighting and they ask them why and they can't remember and then Phil and the girls suggest why don't they have a pop concert instead and so they sing Don't You Want Me Baby and it ends the war and it's terrific. One of the, the best comic strips I've ever read in my entire <laughs> life, frankly, was The Adventures of the Human League in Outer Space. If you Google that, listeners, I'm sure it'll turn up. This is a fascinating comic. I mean, I read it, as I say, around about 1993, mm. and I was used to Guy. He, by that point, he was probably in the, in the throes of being reborn. Still a member of the Justice League, but had Sinestro's ring probably by that point. Of course he had it. He had the yellow ring by 1992, because he had the yellow yeah. ring when Superman died, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, all that stuff was definitely happening. So it's very interesting just to think back and read this for the first time. It's almost a tragedy, everything that happens to Guy Gardner. Yeah, it definitely is. And we're, definitely we is. will talk about it all as it comes, because mm-hmm. it does kind of feed into... Ultimately, as we say, the end game crisis and everything else. Mm-hmm. I don't really have too much to add. The artwork was great. Yeah. It rattled along, great pacing, excellent work from everyone involved. Yeah. My big takeaway from this is the simulation that we see is apparently what this amazing computer on OA predicts would have happened. So that presumably means that planet exists, those kids exist on the planet at that time, currently. Yes. So they're still in that situation. Is anyone going to do anything about that? That's fair. Obviously, Hal's not going to fly down and tackle it himself because he'll end up dying like Guy does. Yeah. Or could they do something about that, you know, knowing that's the situation in advance? I mean, the fact that it specifies a yellow plague is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Maybe the Guardians have lots of signs in space do not approach. Maybe they've sourced it out to the Dark Stars to deal with or something. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. But it's not. that's a valid point. Yeah, that's fair. Shall we have a look at the reader reaction for the time and see what they think? So let's jump ahead to Green Lantern issue 62 Mm -hmm. uh, for Green Lantern's Mail Shoots, which is one of the worst titled letter columns in comics. And there are actually two Green Lantern's Mail Shoot pages in this issue. If we won't cover all the the letters, but uh, we'll give you a good feel for what the contemporary reaction was at the time. So the first letter says, Dear Editor, if not for the excellent interior artwork, Green Lantern 59 would have been a complete waste. Oh dear. 
As it stands, it was only maybe two-thirds waste. Anyway, it was the worst of your issues in a long while. Starting out on the best note, let us drool over the cane and green effort. The dynamic pencils coupled with the conservative inks made the issue viable. In fact, Sid Green may be just a little bit too conservative, i.e. not bright enough, but the special effects he used with the thousands of little dots balanced that small bad point. After the beautiful covers of the last two issues, this one left me cold. The green rays cannot take the place of a well-drawn background. I entirely disagree with that, but never mind. Mm-hmm. And I'd rather see green Hal Jordan Lantern than any of these green-come-lately lanterns. Gosh. Your editorial comment of We Expect the Current Issues Epic to be the latest to draw this accolade, i.e. the best story ever label, has surely ended any possible fortune-telling career for you. The script itself is nothing to complain about. It's the idea that's behind the script that's offensive. I dislike imaginary stories in any way, shape or form. And actually, that's all Earth's other Green Lantern was. I don't want to see Guy Gardner. Any story with him in it doesn't leave room for the development of Green Lantern's personal side. But my main complaint about the issue was the origin theme. We've already seen the Flash cut down by a suspicious tinge surrounding his origin. Yes, (laughs) of course. And now... Mopey. Yep. And now GL falls into the same category. What was the matter with his pre-issue 59 origin? Absolutely nothing in my opinion. But now I will never see Hal Jordan in the same light. Now he is just one guy who is lucky enough to be in the right geographical position at the right time to become Green Lantern. Would you believe in the end of an era? And that's from David Lewin from Lomita, California. Gosh, interesting. So the editorial response to to David's letter is the end of an era or the beginning of an era? We're appealing your worst issue verdict to another court. So Judge Lieberdenthal, take over. So this next letter goes like this. Dear editor, there are a lot of us around, you know. We've been with GL since the beginning, silently passing a judgment, usually favourable, in each issue. Many of us are starting to write, heatedly discussing all the changes that have overcome Hal Jordan and company. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to discuss issue number 59, Earth's Other Green Lantern. Gentlemen, you have overwhelmed me. Wonderful. This was a great story. This had terrific artwork. What more can a fan ask? The very concept of this story, Abin Sir having to choose between two candidates for the post of Green Lantern, was fresh, original and entirely entertaining. You know, it's getting to be a habit with John Broom. I do not know how he does it. Well, I'm one fan who's been on GL from the start and you better believe I'll be here for a whole lot longer. Oh, by the way, Mr Broom, you can't fool us old timers. We know what's going to happen next. For some reason, Hal Jordan gets put out of action and Guy Gardner is called upon to carry on as a temporary emerald gladiator. And that's from Lauren Lieberthal, New York, New York. And the editorial response is... Having Guy Gardner pinch power ring for Hal Jordan is too obvious a development. But if enough readers favour such a sequel, we'll do it. Obviously, says the editor. Yeah, interesting. Yep, Guy does come back. We will see him again. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, the next letter then says... Dear editor, if there is one thing that mars a cover, it's a blurb. The dialogue isn't necessary, especially when it gives a reader a wrong impression of the inside, as in Green Lantern 59. I'm sure you could make a cover that would hold the reader's attention and still have a beautiful cover, perhaps with just the title of the story somewhere on it. Earth's other Green Lantern was a good one. For those who don't know the origin of GL, I confess I was one of those people, there was an interesting recount of it. That's fair, Mm because that was one of the points you highlighted, was the the rehash of that. But I suppose it ties in with what we've always said about every comic being someone's first. Yeah, yeah. and reprints weren't available. You didn't have Wikipedia. Of course, yeah. Just whatever comics you could find. He continues, The idea that there might have been another Green Lantern brings up ideas. Maybe one of Guy Gardner's students would have discovered that Guy was GL. It's interesting to speculate about. Even though Hal Jordan would still become GL and Pieface would discover his identity. It's funny though, because if the mag were about Guy instead of Hal, Guy would be the one who wouldn't be allowed to die in order to appear in the next issue. But Hal, who would be the other deserving one, would have to die. The Peter Pan theme of children never growing up was an absorbing idea. By mistaking GL for a toy, the children proved that they were just that. Children. To them, GL was an almost human toy in the same way that the toys in the market now, you know, dolls that walk, talk, cry, and robots that shoot laser beams from their fingertips, affect kids. And that's from Joe Rosnack, Montville, New Jersey. There's there's no editorial response to that, but that's just made me think of another thing. So basically that planet is just left to evolve and these kids are growing up from being kids. They don't have any kind of direction. Yeah, 
I mean, it's uh, you know, would they go feral in a Logan's Run or Star Trek type way? I'm sure they'd have to know. Flies kind of way. Yeah, it's interesting. I started the other night actually for pleasure. I started reading the Children's Crusade again. You know, the, oh, yeah. the free country, the the Vertigo mm. kind of crossover from the period that I bought Green Lantern Fifty Nine, and that mm. obviously touches on sort of the viciousness of kids mm. in some yeah. ways. You know, and I think people kind of forget how kids are sort of refined as they as they grow up. You yeah, know what I mean, because mm-hmm. we were. We were monsters in our primary school. I cringe some of the stuff that used to happen. It's an interesting point. Ultimately, who would be responsible for that planet and looking after them and making sure anything happened? Mm-hmm. I still want to know what guy did that fixed everything so they could start mm-hmm. aging again properly. That's the only my only criticism of that whole story. Anyway, the next letter then is from Thomas Miller from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah, Thomas is saying, dear editor, the cover of GL fifty seven was possibly the best one penciled by Gil Kane. For all the past year. So why, oh editor, did you have such a dull, unimaginative cover only two issues later, GL59? What? Gosh, gap. <gasps> the March cover had absolutely no background to speak of. The characters... Well, tons of the covers we've done recently have had no background to yeah. speak of. Spectre issue one, for example. It really makes things jump out at you. It's, yeah. It's, ah. I mean, plain neutral... I mean, last, last week's Wonder Woman had a very... Mm. purpley dominate there wasn't was yeah. a huge amount of detail etc mm-hmm. mm, shakes fist anyway okay <laughs> back to the letter the march cover had absolutely no background to speak of the characters were laid out in bad positions what no they weren't it's a classic and the title logo was off to the left side instead of being the centre as usual well <laughs> yes that's because the logo was laid off to the left because the characters were laid out in a dynamic and interesting fashion you're answering your own point there <laughs> anyway Aside from the bad cover, the inside art was good. Oh, was it? Okay. The only low point in Gil Kane's pencils was the distorted pose of Green Lantern on page 11, panel 4. Right, let's check that one quickly. No, it looks fine. What are you talking about? Okay. Ugh. That <laughs> aspect that Gil Kane was really good at just, you know, making it look like it's a human being. Yeah. Uh-huh. Rather than just, anyway, a yeah. rigid. So, Thomas's contentious letter continues. John Broom's story, while lacking a lot of action, was reminiscent of the imaginary stories in Superman. Mm -hmm. I'm glad Hal Jordan has finally found a good friend after wandering the country for so long. But his name, Guy Gardner... Oh sure, I like to see characters whose names are derived from real people, but did author Broom have to make it so obvious? (laughs) Next, I suppose he'll tell us that Guy Gardner has a girlfriend named Lillian Fox. I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah. Is Guy Gardner named after Gardner Fox? Could be. Wow. And there is an editorial response that rounds out the page but doesn't actually reply to Thomas Leather. It just talks about the art team on the current issue. So we go now to the second page of letters from this issue of GL. There's one yes. big long letter which is talking about Hal's current situation. Mm-hmm. doesn't really touch on anything though from GL59. So we're going straight to the final letter and it says Dear Editor, One of the more provocative elements in Earth's Other Green Lantern, as well as in several past GL tales, is the Guardians. Lately, the Guardians have been making one slip after another. Thus, in GL55, they ignored the possibility that some foreign object might reach one of their imprisoned villains, enabling him to escape. This oversight resulted in the disastrous deaths of 13 Green Lanterns. In issue 58, they make the error of removing Hal's ring, presuming he is suffering from combat fatigue without investigating other possibilities. In the current issue 59, we discover they have a machine capable of composing different possibilities in the future based on alternate postulates of events. So why did they not use this machine to predict the Magon escape and thus prevent the GL deaths that occurred? Of course the possibility stands that this machine wasn't invented until after the Magon escape, in which case the Guardians are excused, but this does not excuse their previous errors. I favour a story which reveals the Guardians for the all too fallible beings that they are and which at the same time would give the Green Lanterns more responsibility, that of making sure the Guardians do not make more fatal mistakes. And that's from Jim Vicko from Scarborough, Ontario in Canada. Now that, that's, that's a really interesting point actually, is if the Guardians do have this tech that enables them to see possible outcomes, possible futures and predict things in such a way, then why do things like Crisis of Infinite Earths happen? <laughs> Thing is, it's one of these things, isn't it? If the, it's like in Doctor Who, if the Doctor can travel back in time and time can be written and change yeah. everything, he's never going to have an adventure because he can just go back and fix it. It's a fair point, but it's one of these things that if you think about it too long, it just invalidates and mm-hmm. means you're not going to have any stories. Or could it be that this is not a truly accurate machine? It's, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a fair point, to be honest, yeah. It's a, it's a fair point. The editor responds to, the, to Jim's letter basically says, Immortal, the Guardians, yes. Infallible, no. So here we are. Then the next page is a house ad for Batman 204 featuring the Scarecrow. There you go, listeners. There's some extra content for you. 
That's pretty much it, isn't it? I think. It is indeed. We have encountered Guy Gardner for the first time. He will be back. He will be back. A couple yes. of times. We will see him again. And we'll keep you posted as to developments with him as well. So there we are. Yep. I've already picked out a Guy Gardner cover gallery that will appear on the socials, as will a couple of other bits and bobs, as usual. And if you want to check those out, then on social media, we're on Facebook and Instagram at The Earth 2 Podcast, and on Twitter at podcast underscore Earth 2, and that's the number two for all our social media. And if you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at the Earth 2 Podcast at gmail.com. And this episode and all our episodes are available on our website, and that's the earth2podcast.com. Yep, you can also check us out on YouTube, and if you're enjoying what you can do is you can buy us a coffee. There's a link to that on our link tree, as you find a link to the link tree on our Twitter page and the various other socials. So thank you very much. That's about it for this week, isn't it? Thank you for listening as usual, folks. We hope you enjoyed. Yep. There'll be some Earth 2 Golden Age just society related superhero fun along very very soon indeed be so assured stay tuned and on that note i've been peter and i've been david you'll see you next time on the, the earth, earth 2 podcast. podcast transmatter cube activated return coordinate set for earth prime and in his other hand he has the power battery elevated and he's saying get off this oh, no. <clears throat> <laughs> <He's saying that. laughs> that's your own take straight away isn't it guys some helpful say what you see dialogue as he sweats what <laughs> <laughs> guys saying and you travel a lot Hal that's right guy I used to be a test pilot but now I work for an insurance <laughs> 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 it's, it's a <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so ridiculous. Right, okay. <laughs> Here we go. <clears throat> See, Hal could actually boldly state this and it'd be fine because he's just so arrogant. It's fine. But yeah, here we go. That's right, guy. I used to be a test pilot, but now I work for an <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's, that, it's that thing, wasn't it? Of like how, you know, t- being a test pilot is pretty cool. Working for an insurance company, <laughs> being the man from the Prudential, it's not quite as cool, is it? Right, I'm going to get it, get it, get it. Yeah, okay. I'll cue you in. Then you travel a lot, Hal.